Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the second of five sessions of Projecting Fellows, convening weekly through February 2nd. We are Katie McDonald and Kyle Schumann, and we will begin the evening with a brief introduction before handing it off to this evening's moderators. Additional information on the series, participants, upcoming events, and a link to view the recording of the first session can be found at projectingfellows.com. We are grateful to the University of Virginia School of Architecture for virtually hosting these events, Dean Isla Berman and Chair of Architecture Felipe Correa for their support of the series, Sneha Patel and Darcy Engel for their assistance in preparing and promoting the series, Chris Coate, Graphic Design Fellow at the University of Tennessee for Graphic Design, Wei Hao Wang for Website Design, and Jason Young, Director of the University of Tennessee School of Architecture for taking a chance on us as co-fellows. Each year, several architecture schools nationwide name fellows to join their programs and develop an intensive research or teaching project over a short-term appointment. With the fellowship comes some combination of project support, cross-pollination between research and teaching, and a platform with which to present and exhibit the work. Commonly selected via national call for proposals, fellowship projects are duly indicative of emerging interests in academia and emerging institutional agendas. The series brings together the 2019 to 2020 class of fellows from American architecture schools to explore a cross section of emerging interests in the discipline, as well as the vehicle of the fellowship project. Projecting fellows aims to elucidate the fellowship in its various formats and provide insight into how fellowships are conducted, the critical role of teaching in these appointments and the other types of opportunities afforded. Through the convergence of fellows, the meta project of the architectural fellowship is uncovered. Its role, its curation and its consequences in shaping the discipline. The series was conceived for three audiences. First, the fellows themselves who often enjoy considerable support and the great gift of time to develop their teaching and research agendas, but who often uproot themselves relocating for finite appointments. We hope that this venue might provide a larger collectivity. Second, for an emerging generation of aspiring scholars and architects who may gain some insight into the often opaque fellowship system as a possible route into a scholarly career or the launching of a creative practice, or even the way you might frame a kind of research or thesis project. And third, the broader architecture community by bringing together scholars and designers across geographic and institutional boundaries to discuss new ideas and imperatives for architectural discourse. Each evening in the series will feature short presentations by fellows, followed by a moderated discussion. Some fellowships have been completed while others are still in progress, resulting in a range of completion and rawness in the work. Tonight's session is themed material cultures and it's our pleasure to introduce Brandon Clifford and Alvin Huang as tonight's moderators. Brandon Clifford is associate professor at MIT and director and co-founder of Matter Design, a design practice and research lab that synthesizes art and science, identifying contemporary blind spots by mining ancient knowledge. Matter Design has been recognized as next progressives by Architect Magazine and Clifford has served as the Lefebvre Fellow at The Ohio State University, the Belushi Lecturer at MIT, the John G. Williams Distinguished Visiting Professor at the University of Arkansas, and is the recipient of the American Academy in Rome Prize, the TED Fellowship, the SOM Prize, the Design Biennial Boston Award, and the Architectural League Prize for Young Architects and Designers. Clifford received his Master of Architecture from Princeton University and his Bachelor of Science in Architecture from Georgia Tech. Alvin Wang uh, is an associate professor and director of the graduate and post-professional architecture programs at the University of Southern California. He is a founder and design principal of Synthesis Design and Architecture, a practice which integrates material performance, emergent design technologies, and digital fabrication in contemporary architecture, ranging from high-rise towers and mixed-use developments to temporary pavilions and bespoke furnishings. Synthesis Design Architecture was honored as the 2016 Presidential Emerging Practice of the Year by the AIA Los Angeles chapter and Next Progressive by Architect Magazine. Huang was selected as one of 50 under 50 innovators of the 21st century by Images Publishing and named one of Time Magazine's 20 best inventors. Alvin received his Master of Architecture and Urbanism from the Architectural Association Design Research Laboratory and a Bachelor of Architecture from USC. Brandon and Alvin, welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time to lead us through this evening. Uh, 
Thank you, Katie and Kyle. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, good to see everybody here. Really excited about uh, the talks tonight and uh, going to be some really interesting uh, explorations of uh, material culture and, and really excited to see what our presenters have to say here. Uh, one thing I do want to uh, encourage everybody to do is to uh, think about questions as the uh, presenters are uh, presenting. And I think what I, I do want to kind of start this off with saying that uh, the way Brandon and I would like to see the kind of uh, conversation go uh, following this is more on a kind of uh, meta scale of, of be beginning to look at how the kind of fellowships are uh, something that uh, identify cultural uh, conversations that are happening in architecture at the moment um, and maybe focus a little bit less on the specific technicalities of, of each project but more on the way these projects uh, relate to one another and so with that said uh, definitely as you guys are, are watching these presentations think about uh, uh, the presentations and think about questions that you might have and engage in the chat and put questions in the chat and we'll, we'll keep things running that way so with that said, uh, I'd like to introduce the first speaker, uh, Adam Barrett Miller. Adam Barrett Miller was the 2019-20 Race and Gender in the Built Environment Fellow at the University of Texas, Austin, where he continues to teach, and is co-founder of New Stars Design Group. Miller holds a Bachelor of Arts from Cornell University and a Master of Architecture from the University of California, Berkeley, where he, leads the, where he held the 2013 Otto Scheidwald Memorial Fellowship. Adam? It's all yours. Thanks, Alvin. Uh, and thank you to Katie and Kyle. Um, give me one second just to share my screen. Cool, thanks. Um, so yeah, thanks to Katie and Kyle um, for organizing this. Uh, can you see my title card? Yeah, cool. Thank you also to UVA Architecture for hosting and to everyone on online, thanks for listening. Thanks for coming. I'm the 2019 to 2021 Race and Gender in the Built Environment Fellow at UT Austin. which was previously a one-year appointment that became extended to a two-year appointment during my time. Established in 2016, it's a teaching fellowship for designers and scholars who are early in their careers, whose work centers on the relationships between race, gender, and the built environment. It's generous with providing space and time to the fellow. It requires teaching one seminar in the fall semesters and one advanced studio in the spring semesters, which are original coursework related to the research. I came to the school with an interest in asking, what a queer space in architecture is or might be. To talk about what is queer is also to talk about what is common and what is normal in architecture. It's also to talk about aesthetics, taste, politics, race, gender, and sexuality, and to grapple with the baggage of modern architecture, which many of us are currently coming to terms with. While at the school, I co-organized a symposium on gender equity in architecture with students and faculty in spring 2020, and I hope this doesn't trigger anyone, but I'm, I'm about to show you an image of people in a room together. Um, so here's an image of uh, the attendance during that event. Um, but I assure you, no one was harmed in the production of, of this event. It took place before crap hit the fan. Um, here are images of three course syllabi developed um, at UT. I don't have time to go into each in detail, but later in this presentation, I'll be showing student work from the middle course, Dragging Modernity, which was an advanced architecture studio. Queering Architectural Taste on the left was a theory seminar and Public Parts in Private was also a studio. If anyone's interested in learning more, please feel free to message me or ask during the Q&A. So I'm going to read a polemical essay with images of research and student work and some, some personal design work from my uh, practice, New Stars. Um, simultaneously. So this talk is titled Politics of Taste. What is the politics of taste? Taste is something that is not always directly addressed in architecture, but it is always in the background. Architecture is a taste culture. 
It delimits the field of what gets to count as architecture and what does not, what counts as beautiful and ugly. As terms rarefied in our aesthetic discourse, the beautiful and its foil, the ugly, produce material consequences for the world around us. And in the context of the built environment, these paradigmatic aesthetic categories are the methodology for shaping our worlds, destroying, delaying, obscuring if ugly, preserving, impelling, promulgating if beautiful. I'm showing images of some iconic representations of modern, modernism's beauty in their downfall, being demolished to show how what has been considered the apex of tastefulness can be proven inadequate to meet the claims that they um, aspire to for social value. Beautiful and ugly have material and cultural consequences for the built environment. The beautiful has historically been constructed as public, masculine, straight, and white, with the ugly as its other, thus leaving many out of the question, silence, and subjected. While the connection between masculinity and beauty may not seem immediately obvious, it is clearer when considering the post-industrial aesthetics of modernism, its glorification of sleek masculine monumentality, and the repudiation of the ornamental, per pervasious, and non-Western aesthetics coded as feminine, weak, and inferior, with modernity here racialized and coded white. One of the worst myths of modern architecture has been that mar architecture is autonomous or apolitical. A look to material culture says otherwise. Architecture has always been political, and one aspect of its politics lies in architecture's role in the construction of good taste and an equivocation between good taste and social value. I'm interested in the politics of taste with othering principles so that we can reconfigure the common sense for a more equitable world. To do so means reapproaching what is considered good taste. People have told me I like bad taste, which is funny because uh, they never say I have bad taste, just that I like it. Perhaps I'm shielded from having bad taste because of my academic armor and my fancy degrees. I'm interested in understanding why things are considered bad taste in the first place and who is said to have it and who is allowed to like it. I have an interest in the mechanisms of how taste becomes style and how style goes out of fashion. In the words of Denise Scott Brown, there's always a reaction against the style of the most recent past. In my design practice, New Stars, some in images here, I've been exploring my interest in bad taste, designing stage productions for a music festival in Oakland, which happens to be hosted by queer film legend and Pope of Trash, John Waters. But what is taste? For Waters, taste is style. To know bad taste, of course, you must have been taught the rules of the tyranny of good taste so that you can yearn to break them. In taste, of how you define yourself against the world. This is where taste gets political. It's how we form social groups in common and define within that community a common sense, what makes sense to the group, to distinguish between what is sensible and what is insensible, or in other words, what is noise. For Rancière, this is the politics of aesthetics. It is the struggle over that dividing line between what can be heard as sensible and what is discarded as noise. The thing is, everyone has taste. For Pierre Bourdieu, tastes are the practical affirmation of an inevitable difference. In matters of taste, all determination is negation, and tastes are perhaps first and foremost distaste. Disgust provoked by horror, or visceral intolerance for the taste of others. Taste thus delimits the possibility of sympathy within groups and empathy between different cultures. Taste is always a regulating principle in the work of architecture. I think a very urgent issue is that there has been a slippage between what is truthful and what is tasteful. And this is in part due to many of our institutions failing us a general breakdown of trust between people and the institutions meant to work for the people. We can see how this slippage has led 
uh, to societal divisions? How have architects as agents and shapers of material culture and the institutionalization of good taste participated in this slippage between what is truthful and what is tasteful? Many of us today are grappling with this question to face the implications of the way architecture has pra been practiced historically and how to change it. If we can address these structural challenges, the discipline and education of architecture can easily participate in, uh, or not easily, <laughs> but it can participate in remediating trust and expanding participation in the production of the built environment. Demands from those who don't usually fit that image of what an architect is supposed to look like are finally starting to be heard rather than being tuned out as noise. Demands from students and practitioners alike institutions across the nation have been sounded to address the structural barriers to entering and staying in architecture. In solidarity with the racial justice initiatives like Black Lives Matter movement. This past year, we have seen how the othering aspects of architecture urgently require a collective redress. To make space for difference within our field, we must recognize also the construction of beautiful and ugly and the limitations that a binary aesthetic logic have if we're going to expand what success and meaning can look like. While architecture has been a predominantly straight masculine white field that, that is changing, a 2018 study of the experience of architecture, um, one some of the research shown here, uh, called Equity by Design, uh, which was a survey of the experience of architecture graduates, the largest of its kind, surveying over 14,000 individuals, found that 46% of its respondents identified as female, 53% as male, 1% as non-binary, and of those respondents, 80% were white, 90% were straight. We continue to lack detailed statistics around those identifying as non-binary and gender non-conforming. However, looking at age, as you can see in this graph, demographics become significantly more female at least and somewhat more racially diverse the younger you look suggesting that the future for diverse leadership of our profession is possible if we can address the structural challenges along the way one of those structural barriers is in what is allowed to be considered good taste and what is allowed to be considered valuable for architectural inquiry if architecture exists that? Oh, I'm over time. I'm almost done. Sorry. If architecture is this in part as an expertise of taste, then the major role of architectural education has been to historically intervene to reconfigure students' tastes towards the instructor's own taste as a model. We can see how this follows a higher relationship of knowledge from instructor to student. We can also see how this might stop in its tracks or alienate some students whose tastes don't fit or conform to what is considered beautiful. When we assess form as instructors, we assess it in terms of what we see as beautiful because it, for us, it produces for us a kind of pleasure, even if we don't call beauty by its name. And for quite some time, as Diana Agrest and Mabel O. Wilson have described, what is beautiful has been based on what is white and masculine, public and uh, modern. As such, students are asked to chase this image of success, a condition of success that tends to favor those that already easily identify with this image or look like it. One way to expand participation in architecture as a discipline is to make space for the taste of others. That means making space for different images of success and legitimate non-normative frameworks of value. This means to decenter the beautiful, ugly binary's position as the aesthetic metric of value and expand our lexicon to better understand a uh, design for communities and difference. To think queerly might be considered a conceptual space beyond this binary's thinking. This is a queer space within architecture. Queer thinking resists duality and allows for a decentering of a single aesthetic paradigm, making space for aesthetic difference. This recognition of difference in taste and uh, the potential for um, this recognition, difference in taste, and the potential design implications of those tastes is what I'm thinking of as a solidarity of taste, where solidarity is a unity while maintaining and recognizing difference, a discordant whole. This unity in recognizing difference is something I think has real material implications for our world. So here's some images of the student work. Students were asked to design for discordant holes, analyze and understand their own taste and experiences, 
identifying develop a design logic or what I'm calling minor aesthetic category, which moves beyond the beautiful ugly binary. If we wish for a more equitable world, we should not attempt to replace the center currently being held by beauty with another term or concept, but rather to address a world without a center, designing for a periphery of aesthetics. Could a solidarity of non-normative taste liberate us from an over-reliance on pleasure and disgust in shaping the built environment? Uh, here's a fact sheet. Um, since this panel is titled Material Culture, I think the materials discussion in the Marxist sense requires some just transparency. It's also to talk about uh, not just the content, but the conditions for the production of that content. This too is part of material culture. This is already public information, and I think it's good to have a collective conversation about ways to expand uh, participation in academic discourse um, and equitable labor conditions. Thank you. Sorry for going over. Um, and these are credits. Great, thank you, Adam. That thank you, you you didn't go over too much. We're just to notify everyone. Alvin and I are going to ping in just to to let the presenter know that they're at the ten minute mark. Uh, but Adam, that was really great. Um, I'm excited to be here, everyone. I'm going to take over for a moment and uh, introduce our next speaker. Zach Cohen was the 2019-2020 Yeezios Visiting Assistant Professor at The Ohio State University. And he's continuing to teach and is the co-founder of Common Craft. Zach holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Carnegie Mellon University and a Master of Science in Architecture Studies from MIT. Uh, Zach, it's also really great to see you again and uh, please take it away. Cool, let me uh, get situated. Uh, okay. uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Cool. Uh, let me move you guys out of the way. Um, so as uh, as Brendan said, I'm Zach Cohen. I'm the ESEO's visiting assistant professor. Still, uh, the my term was also extended to 2019 uh, through 2021. Um, and so uh, I continue to teach at, at Ohio State. But um, thanks, Brendan, for the intro. And um, thank you, Katie and Kyle, for organizing, uh, UVA for hosting, to all my fellow fellows for, for participating. And of course, to those at Ohio State that invited me to be a fellow there. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share some of my ongoing fellowship work this evening. And I'll do my best, uh, as I said earlier, to, uh, in, uh, before we started to, to adhere to the 10 minutes. Um, I'll spend most of my presentation discussing the kind of arc of my research, uh, but in the spirit of having a candid conversation about about uh, the role of these fellowships in architecture schools and the discipline at large, I'd like to start by sharing a bit about how my own fellowship came to be. Uh, so to begin with, the SEO's fellowship was designed to bring in a person with digital fabrication research. And there really aren't many fellowships or academic positions in general that have that focus. Uh, I think digital fabrication is still sort of finding its place within architectural academia. Um, but maybe the most unique aspect of, of my fellowship story is that there was already a person that had the fellowship before me uh, which is intended to be for two years originally, uh, but they unexpectedly left for another position. So the school had a need for someone who could afford both uh, financially and personally to uproot their lives immediately. And then after I received the fellowship, I learned that the search committee originally aimed to find a woman to fill the position, but the lack of gender diversity in the digital fabrication community, I'd say is even more glaring than it is in the architecture community at large. And there were very few female candidates. And then when one female candidate did receive an offer, she was unable to accept because she couldn't receive a work visa in time. So I don't mean to sell myself short here. Uh, and I do think I received my fellowship mainly because of my work, but these privileges being able to afford the costs of a sudden move and, and being a US citizen undeniably played a role. Uh, and I think these fellowships in general require these two things. One, being able to create the opportunity for yourself, for example, going to an elite school, uh, and work on innovative research, but also being in a position to accept the opportunity once it's been created. Uh, and I think it's clear that a lot of aspiring architects can't do both of these things. They either don't have the means to create fellowship opportunities or the ability to accept the precarity that comes with them. 
Okay, so there's my kind of uh, preface, and I, I hope to have maybe a, a fuller conversation about some of those things later. Um, but as I mentioned, my fellowship was geared towards digital fabrication research. However, I was also given the opportunity to teach my own studios, uh, co-organize a symposium, give a lecture, and create an exhibition on my fellowship work, which will open this spring. And I just want to give a very quick glimpse into these other aspects of, uh, of my fellowship work. So in the spring of 2020, I taught a studio called Recasting Concrete, which investigated how, when, and why architects should use 3D printing concrete. I, I work with students to develop their own concrete 3D printing methodologies and then use them to redesign or re, quote unquote recast typical tectonic conditions in their own school building, which is made predominantly from cast in place concrete. Uh, and then last fall, in light of the recent PPE production efforts by architecture schools during the pandemic, I taught a studio that speculated on distributing manufacturing as a new paradigm of architectural labor. Each student was given a 3D printer to take home and in groups, the, student works, uh, the students worked together, but remotely, of course, uh, to design and prototype various new models of architectural production. This group, for example, developed an online platform for what they called uh, quote unquote digital quilting. And you can actually still visit it at commonthreads.online. And this is them at the end of the semester coming together to assemble the 3D printed quilt that they designed and fabricated from their respective homes. Also last spring, I co-organized a symposium with my then co-fellow uh, Gallo Canizares called Homing the Machine. And as Gallo mentioned in last week's session, digital fabrication conferences really tend to fixate on the what and how of the technology and, and less on the why. Uh, in other words, on the te technical and not on the conceptual. So we invited people in the digital fabrication community to discuss why they work on digital fabrication. In other words, what really drives them and really what they view as digital fabrication's role or value even in architecture. And finally, also in the spring of 2020, I participated in Knowlton's lecture series and gave a talk called Leaky Machines or How to Build Sympathy with a Building Machine. And I talked about work like this, which was an unannounced long durational performance that I did in Knowlton during the first week of my fellowship. Here I'm using software that I developed to draw each slice of a 3D print by hand. And I'd say that for the duration of the six hour improvisation, I embodied the repetition of the 3D printer in order to sympathize with it and that such forms of sympathy enable new forms of craft that look potentially like this. So my work generally critiques uh, the tendency of architects to look at digital fabrication as a practice of tools and techniques. Um, in contrast, I really begin working on digital fabrication by looking at it as a physical and even philosophical act. And I think my ongoing fellowship is a, is a good example of this kind of approach. So I'm gonna present the kind of trajectory of this work from its beginnings to its current state, including uh, some of the unexpected turns it took along the way. And my goal in doing so is really to illustrate how and why my research questions evolved and also maybe more importantly, how I try to think and not just make architecture through digital fabrication. Um, so this image is really where I'm gonna end, but I, I thought I would just show it first so you don't get disoriented, hopefully. Um, so during my graduate thesis work at MIT, uh, I developed this idea that we can design with digital fabrication machines solely by manipulating the time they take to make something. And I call this approach machine delay fabrication. And I demonstrated machine delay fabrication through the development of a speculative method of 3D printing concrete that I call pointillistic time-based deposition or just dripping. And in the dripping workflow, uh, a designer programs, I don't know if you guys can hear that, it's quite loud. Uh, a designer programs a robotic arm to drop concrete at specific points for specific durations, uh, and then instructs it when to revisit each point with the new drop. So this visualization here on the left imagines that each drop has its own clock, and the robot then becomes the thing that kind of keeps time of all the drops. It's sort of material metronome, if you will. Uh, and here's a kind of close-up of what that process looks like. I then ex started to explore uh, alternative aesthetics and we can talk about, I saw Brandon already had a question about what alternative aesthetics means. Um, and I think uh, Adam's presentation certainly touched on this. So I also started to explore alternative aesthetics um, through dripping. Uh, and these aesthetics really aim to challenge uh, digital fabrication's aesthetic biases, not just its obsession with precision, but really questioning digital fabrication's bias towards homogenizing, or I'd say even sterilizing materiality. I also explored new tectonic possibilities for concrete construction. Uh, for example, a new way to make a column. Um, and eventually I started to realize some of the limits of the dripping methodology, which included among other things, uh, a lack of structural reinforcement. 
Uh, so I came to the SEOS Fellowship with a simple idea for how to further both dripping and machine delay fabrication. What instead of dripping concrete onto blank slates, I drip concrete into a rebar cage. And that's how I came up with incremental vertical deposition and compaction, or simply piling. Uh, so since ro a robotogram wasn't really in my research budget, uh, the first thing I did was to design and fabricate my own pile machine. So the rough overview of the system uh, is that there's a concrete pump over here that feeds concrete to uh, what I call the smusher, which is actually a, a fixed steel plate with an aluminum nozzle embedded into it. And the smusher is uh, attached to electronic winch, which moves it vertically uh, through the cage. So there's only one axis of movement. And this whole process is orchestrated by a microcontroller and a series of relays, which are, which are back here. Uh, and so piling works similarly to dripping insofar as um, the whole process is controlled entirely through timing. Uh, here, concrete is simultaneously deposited into and smushed out of the rebar cage layer by layer with short delays in between. And the size of each deposit is determined by the amount of time that the concrete pump is turned on, while the extent of the vertical in incrementation is determined by the amount of time that the electronic winch is turned on. And these two durations alternate in a kind of rhythmic fashion. And I'd say a lot of uh, the initial research involved sort of tuning the mechanics of the machine to work with the mechanics of the materials and, and, and really trying not to produce these kinds of piles. And eventually, uh, we, my research team and I, uh, I was working with, with, a, with a few student researchers, uh, did come up with some consistent results. And then just as I had done with dripping, I asked myself, now that I can robotically pile concrete, what can I build? Well, it just so happened that when the Knowlton School of Architecture was endowed, it was gifted five classical columns by Mr. Knowlton himself. Apparently, Mr. Knowlton, like others that I'll later mention, fancied the classical style for institutional buildings. And these columns are now coincidentally located right outside the school shop. So I started to wonder, what if I use piling to reimagine classical orders? And I broke my exploration into this quote unquote other order into studies of three components, bases, capitals, and flutes. So here are some of the different kinds of column bases that I could make, which vary from very melty, maybe to slightly less melty. And different kinds of column capitals that I can make, which look a bit like the acanthus leaves on the top of uh, Corinthian columns. That's 10 minutes, by the way, Zach. Okay. Uh, I could create fluting by using the vertical rebar to shape the concrete as the smusher smushed it outwards. Uh, and I developed post processing techniques that could both accentuate these flutes and give the rebar the material coverage that it needed. And then in the middle of developing my new digital order, this order appeared. Uh, and as you probably know, Trump's proposed executive order, which was now published almost a year ago, would have mandated that all future federal buildings be built in the classical style. Uh, the executive order that he ended up signing uh, just a little while ago in late December stopped short of mandating classical style for federal buildings, but establishes it as the quote unquote default in DC and the quote unquote preferred everywhere else. Uh, but last February, when, last February, when the proposed order was published, I was really struck by this one editorial response by the New York Times architecture critic Michael Killiman, which essentially argues that Greek columns are easy to weaponize because they are so identifiably classical. Uh, Killiman suggests that architectural forms can resist weaponization if they don't conform to any architectural style, and he cites uh, David Ajay's museum here as an example of such a potential nonconformity or nonconformist style or non-style, maybe. Uh, I then began to think about the, the, the politics of digitally designed and fabricated forms and, and if and how such forms might resist political weaponization. Uh, and I'd say that since architecture's digital turn, a variety of architectural styles have been put forth from parametricism to the many variants of the post-digital that are still, uh, still emerging really. I'd argue that all these styles are as recognizably digital as a Greek column is classical and thus equally as vulnerable to being weaponized. I also think it's important to note that the digital fabrication community tends to be apolitical, but but maybe only by default, really. Uh, and, and I think this last year uh, sort of demanded of all of us that we reflect on our work uh, and, and especially the politics within it, even if they're not readily visible. So uh, in reflecting on my own work, which happened to be reimagining the classical at the right time, what I'd like to propose is that one of digital fabrication's strengths is the ability to produce forms that do not conform to either preconceived digital models or predetermined architectural aesthetics. In other words, I think that digital fabrication has the ability to create architectural forms that can resist political weaponization. Piles, for example, are classicizing in their bases, capitals, drums, and flutes, and yet they are not classical. 
They display undulating gradated forms and yet they are not digital. They are visibly reinforced and yet they're not modern either. Piles approach architectural styles, but ultimately resist them. And I'd say a pile opens itself up to all these many readings by being nothing other than a trace of piling itself, a process with no objective other than to pile and smush concrete. And when I say trace, I really mean something like this. Uh, here, Peter Eisenman is reworking a concept borrowed from Jacques Derrida and defines trace uh, as the record of motivation, the record of an action, not an image of another object origin. Eisenman also not so coincidentally introduces a definition in an essay entitled The End of the Classical. In the essay, Eisenman argues in part that traces will end the classical by encouraging architectural users or observers to become architectural readers, to really read into forms that are always in the process of becoming. So here's the end that you already saw. Uh, of course, deconstructivist architects like Peter Eisenman are as decidedly apolitical as the digital fabrication community. And so we're not, uh, so we're not surprisingly easy targets of the original executive order. So the question that I really want to ask is, and the question that I, I'll leave you with, and I, I leave my fellowship with in a way, is how can we use the traces of digital fabrication, a technology that is mainly only ever geared towards neoliberal and techno-capitalist efficiencies towards the creation of a newly politicized architectural readership. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Zach. Um, next up, we have uh, Jacob Comercy. Jacob Comercy was the 2019-2020 William Muschenheim Fellow at the University of Michigan, where he continues to teach. Mercy holds a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Illinois at Chicago and a Master of Architecture from Princeton University. All yours, Jacob. Thank you, Alvin. Um, let me just share this screen. Um, so thanks. Um, first, a big thanks to Katie and Kyle for the invitation and all the hard work that they put toward um, making this event happen. I know that it is a lot to do something like this, let alone remotely, so thank you. Um, and of course, to the fellowship committee at Michigan for the opportunity in the first place. Um, uh, I wanted to just also thank the team of students and uh, friends and professionals who helped uh, make the fellowship possible and helped produce the work that you're gonna see. Um, Christian Austin, Laura Lisbona, Sangwon G. Eli Back, Dan Ray Zhang, Adrian DiCarado, Chris Humphrey, um, and graphic design by Sam Wood. Um, the, the work is part of a joint exhibition called Practice Product Protocol, produced alongside um, my good friends and fellow fellows, Eduardo Mediero and Matis Gross um, who will be presenting later in the series together. We were fortunate enough to um, be able to uh, produced the, uh, the exhibition in C2 prior to the statewide lockdown in Michigan and the attempted uh, capture of the governor. So um, unfortunately, people didn't get to see it in person, but we had an online um, presentation. So I feel fortunate for that. Um, so um, the fellowship work that I did and the work that I continue to do is largely focused on co-working and co-living organizations in high density cities in the US. Um, these organizations have sprung up as we know, largely as a response to rising real estate values, urban migration and digital nomadism. Um, with an in incoming generation of people um, finding low risk rental and subscription models, various amenities and tight knit communities desirable um, because they provide conditions they wouldn't otherwise um, be able to afford. Um, I'm not naive to how fraught politically these things can be, but I think they're, they're uh, prolific enough that they're worth paying attention to and seeing how one might um, kind of burrow their way in in an ethical manner. Um, and obviously a lot of these assumptions about these organizations or companies have been thrown into question after the pandemic and the downfall of WeWork. Um, but many of the core things I'm interested in um, have remained largely intact. So one of those things in particular um, is these companies production of totalizing environments they call space as service models. 
So WeWork, for instance, is equipped uh, or was equipped not only with desk, desks, conference rooms, and coffee bars, but also an in, invisible set of protocols which facilitate the politics, organizational structures, and management of people in space. Um, so the provocation of the fellowship is to ask how designers can exercise their expertise toward more systemic ends, cautiously inserting themselves into the quote space as service framework. The hypothesis is that by leveraging strategies of co-working and co-living organizations who have systematized and streamlined their hardware and software, architects work can achieve greater impact by producing their work at scale rather than a one-off. Um, uh, the project offers an opportunity to learn from these organizational models of leasing office space, performing interior fit outs with mass manufactured equipment, furniture, technology and amenities and subleasing that space for a profit. By adopting practices more closely related to that of a furniture industrial designer, the project is investigating a way in which architects might intervene um, in a space of co working and co living to reclaim agency in the built environment at a scale larger than an exhibition pavilion or individual building. And full disclosure, I'm admittedly value um, larger scale over local interventions. Um, ironically, I'm presenting all of this in a local intervention that is an exhibition that nobody saw until now, so which is great. Um, so uh, the work on display is a proposal for a readily deployable catalog of equipment which can be quickly assembled and disassembled in a given building with an empty floor plate unbound by building regulations and costing a fraction of ground up building. Um, the project pushes back against prevailing domestic architecture in the States, particularly its socially isolating features, strict programmatic delineations and wasteful redundancies in utilities, furniture and equipment. So in lieu of these models, the work proposes a system of parts where the only owned property is that which can fit into this nine by six by 12 living capsule where all of the other pieces of equipment are uh, distributed amongst the, the community. Um, this living capsule conceived of as a perforated powder coated steel structure has a thick base allowing for storage of bedding and other personal effects, also doubling as a seat or a porch. The unit contains foldable storage racks, accordion doors, sound and light proof curtains, and a built-in ambient ceiling lighting. Um, these mobile sleeping units accommodate a variety of configurations ranging from informal clustered arrangements to a more structured rigid grid. And each piece of equipment anticipates the space as service model with the formal qualities of the architecture working to facilitate those services and protocols. What you're seeing is actually, um, what you're seeing is a standing sitting dining table, which doubles as a standing sitting workspace. The table's thickness allows for the storage of shared plates, um, bowls, glasses, silverware, et cetera. Um, and as a kind of formal cousin to the table, it's essentially turned upside down. The kitchen and its equipment, oven, dishwasher, et cetera, wasn't so much reimagined as it was consolidated into a line um, the kitchen is double sided um, with an overhead light structure, which allows for the hanging of shared cookware on a steel mesh grid. Um, and the next piece of equipment, the one on the top shelf, um, is a thick storage wall with gaps for passing through, people to pass through, containing space for public display as well as hidden storage contained within pull drawers. The piece, in addition to storing and displaying things, acts as a partial wall, which helps to break up the otherwise open plan. Um, so all of these pieces are, are basically one thing that do many things. Um, uh, this, this thick storage wall um, has the capacity to provide a threshold um, to divide one space from another, store and display objects. So, all of this is kind of about an economy of means to go back to the, the wasteful redundancy of utilities and furniture comment. Um, the only one-to-one -one prototype I was, I built alongside the team that I mentioned um, was this one. 
um, and it holds all the other tiny prototypes. This is in the, the, the annex building at University of Michigan. So it's a storage and display system that in the case of this exhibition, again, holds these tiny prototypes. Um, and this is just an alternate configuration that sort of forms a more distinct intimate interior condition um, by uh, using this ripstop fabric that kind of- uh, Plug it. Oh, um, uh, anyway, so. Um, so I'll just go with it. So the toilet, and I, I get a little more time because of that though, I was distracted. Um, so the, the toilet and shower unit plugs into existing building infrastructure. Um, again, all of this should be understood as, as being placed within existing buildings rather than ground up construction. It contains a sliding door leading to a shower head above with an adjacent toilet. Storage compartments for shared robes and slippers occupy the thickness of the walls. Um, Robes, towels, and other pieces of clothing can be washed in this laundry system, which is again, a thick line um, with mirrored storage, folding space, and equipment on the other side. Um, so this is an illustration of all the pieces of equipment clustered into an open plan. So the units are placed in various orientations, creating domestic pockets, which are divided by storage and display walls, um, and then filled with kitchens, dining areas, and workspaces. Um, and finally, the, the incorporation of all this equipment into the Sims video game. So one of the most popular video games of all time, um, the Sims has been a vehicle for gamers to imagine their domestic dream scenarios. Um, so in line with my celebration of architecture operating at scale, video games as a democratic mode of representation um, and reception of content, I think stand, stand out as particularly valuable as a means of disseminating um, ideas. Um, so while the game has grown socially and architecturally progressive since its release in 2000, its offerings still remain orthodox. Um, I found the ways in which the game designers understood object affordances to be largely in line with something akin to the Neufert catalog the geometry privileging a very particular type of body um, and ableness. Um, it turns out it's quite difficult uh, within the confines of pedestrian modding to alter this. So when I input my own equipment, um, strange approximations of conventional furniture uses are revealed and all kinds of glitches where Sims are trying to use the pieces um, that they don't understand. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's all. So thanks so much for listening. Um, again, thank you so much to Katie and Kyle for the opportunity and for and um, Alvin and Brandon for moderating. Great, thank you, Jacob. Okay, our next speakers are Katie McDonald and Kyle Schumann. Katie and Kyle jointly held the 2019-2020 Tennessee Architecture Fellowship at the University of Tennessee and are co-founders of After Architecture. They're currently assistant professors at the University of Virginia. Katie holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Cornell University and a Master of Architecture from Harvard University. And Kyle holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Cornell and a Master of Architecture from Princeton. So with that, um, Katie and Kyle, take it away. Thanks so much, Brendan. Uh, we're going to share our screen with everyone now. And so uh, we'd like to begin um, this fellowship presentation um, by thanking Director Jason Young and the Fellowship uh, Search Committee at the University of Tennessee for taking a chance on us as co-fellows, um, as well as our welcoming colleagues for being sounding boards throughout and our research assistants uh, who helped with some of the projects you're going to see today, as well as students who engaged with the work in multiple courses. Um, I think it's worth noting uh, that it's, uh, I would say, maybe an irregularity for us to hold a fellowship jointly, um, where so many of these positions are aimed at individuals. And we had actually applied um, to this fellowship, as, as well as others, um, independently from one another with sort of different um, project proposals. Uh, and I think, um, 
at some point the uh, search committee must have realized that we were sort of collaborators and had been since um, 2012. And so we were invited at a certain point to merge our proposals and we're incredibly grateful for the opportunity to then continue with that process and then hold um, the fellowship jointly. Our fellowship experience was critical in launching an ongoing body of work investigating questions at the intersection of material technology and culture. Our presentation today is structured around motivations and experiments and will share some conceptual framing, a series of student projects and other fellowship activities and finally our fellowship uh, installation. The teaching opportunities in particular, our, our fellowship came as many others do with um, kind of research funding and other sort of resources, but the teaching opportunities in particular, uh, we found incredibly fruitful. We were each responsible for teaching uh, three courses each over the course of our year long fellowship. And two of those courses uh, were co-taught and we were granted near complete autonomy in determining the pedagogy and content um, for those courses. And we found that to be extremely valuable and you'll see some of the results of those two courses today. We're going to begin by considering a question central to modes of construction since industrialization, um, which is how does one straighten the log? The conventional answer would be through subtraction to transform the raw arcing forms of trunks and branches, which balance their search for light, water, and structural integrity into a simple orthogonal prism. Another would be that taken by Alan Wexler in his piece, Reframing Nature, in which small incisions are made into the wandering trunk of a tree and wedges are slipped into the mass, redirecting the center line of the tree into a straight path. This additive operation maintains the trunk's taper, its protective skin, its efficient surface area. Wexler's log, leveraging the embodied intelligence of the tree, suggests another question entirely, why straighten, which is, to stay, which is to say standardize the log? So much of this dialogue yeah, is situated in the earliest days of the Industrial Revolution, um, which births standards because mass production demanded uniform modes of production regardless of geography. American construction embraced such modes of production for their ease, speed, and cheapness. And there's perhaps no building product quite so easy and cheap as the humble two by four which subsequently expanded uh, to encompass an entire range of sequential construction processes, uh, practices, and building products. The standard technology drove the housing boom uh, in the post-war and early 20th century, championed by purveyors of prefab housing who dressed this new technology in historic clothing in the form of previous architectural styles and floor plans, enabling widespread acceptance and adoption by the general public. Beyond industry, standardization practices were embraced by modern architects. In 1921, The Dwelling of Our Time, an exhibition by Lily Reich and Mies van der Rohe, displayed full-scale prototype homes surrounded by displays of the materials and products from which the houses were made, a blatant association between industrial materials and modern design. The tectonics of, more recent, of the more recent digital turn extend the tendency to subtract custom form from standardized materials. Laser cutting, CNC milling, and water jetting privilege the subtraction of parts from sheet materials. Our approach taken here is situated between the totalizing digital world and the unfolding effects of climate change. To decrease construction's environmental impact, we propose a conceptual shift from the authority of the human designer to a discursive and systematic relationship between design intent and ecology, enabled by maturing computing technologies. This approach, which we term bioagency, questions the historic top-down model of design authorship by leveraging the digital to make use of the embodied intelligence of biological material. Our fellowship explored um, these ideas through a series of activities that engaged multiple audiences. Themes of human and material authorship were unpacked in a small symposium held just before the pandemic unraveled, as well as a seminar in which students collaborated with a variety of means and methods. These included raw materials, uh, a variety of raw materials, machine visioning technologies, and digital simulation, as well as living organisms, including bacterial agents, barley seedlings, and the Eastern time caterpillar, a social insect. An advanced studio uh, titled Material Misbehavior and Taught in the Fall, our first semester of the fellowship, 
brought to the surface the critical role of uh, role processes, systems, and assembly might play in reconciling the desires of humans with the needs of larger ecologies. Students documented local invasive plant species and developed techniques for extracting their emergent material properties, demonstrating their use through full-scale architectural prototypes. One group of two students took fallen branches from the Bradford pear tree and 3D scanned them using an, a ubiquitous uh, consumer grade smartphone uh, 3D scanning app. The digitized branch catalog was analyzed for a variety of qualities, including curvature, deviation from a line, and average circumference. The resulting form of the installation was determined partially by the designers and their design intent, and partially by the range of curves and thicknesses of the branches. Otherwise, uh, we can think of that as the, the material quality of, the, of uh, these species. Another project took photographs of the burning bush, identified the branches digitally, and matched branches to create a distributed joint logic in which many small connections produce a strong but flexible structure capable of adapting to varied topographies. Another group of three formed grass and bamboo plants into fibrous furniture that could be alternately thin and dense or thick and porous. The traditional culmination of a fellowship um, seems to be a kind of installation or exhibition. And, and I think the teaching was really important for us um, but the final kind of installation allowed us to synthesize some of the ideas developed over the course of the teaching. Specifically, the work drew from Tennessee's iconic landscape of invasive plants. Um, so here you see a kind of kudzu valley, uh, as well as waste from landscape maintenance and forestry activities. In, an, in designing the installation, we drew from agricultural practices such as fodder production and artists such as Diana Scherer, developing methods to grow barley seed hydroponically into volumetric molds. The process allowed us to create grown volumes and surfaces that self-assemble through the interweaving of growing roots without adhesive. The forms and textures produced are a mediation between our design intent and the behavior of the barley itself. These studies led to the design of an installation we called Homegrown, seen here in its site on display at the Knoxville Museum of Arts South Garden, between the stepping pink Tennessee marble facade of the museum, designed by Edward Larrabee Barnes, and the historic brick elevation of the neighboring factory-turned-condominium building. The installation's four walls form an exterior room within the larger walled garden. A series of volumes are subtracted from the walls to create openings that serve as doorways and windows. Traditional fabrication uh, of molds often relies on subtractive processes, CNC milling, foam cutting, etc., with each mold producing only a single unique geometry. For this project, we built a ground up system which we called pillow forming, which preferences variable over repetitious form, allowing for an infinite number uh, of formal variations through a malleable process, the injection and removal of air repeated again and again. Wall designs were modeled digitally and then constructed physically using this pneumatic molding system. The three foot by 10 foot machine consists of a rigid plywood surface and a grid of inflatable vinyl pillows. Each pillow can be inflated individually, expanding upwards as it fills with air. The flexible top surface of each pillow is attached to all neighboring pillows, such that when they're all inflated to different heights, they create a single and continuous surface against which wall panels are formed. The resulting installation proposes an alternative material ethic by making use of small scale landscaping waste in including invasive species such as kudzu, bamboo, and various tree species, as well as forestry waste. The plant fibers are formed into lightweight wall scale panels using a liquid bio-based binder. In a nod to the materials of traditional American framing, the panels are faced in pine needles and rest on a base of dimensional lumber. The top edge steps up and down, suggesting typical forms of, a, of domestic life, a kind of rewilding of the domestic. 10 minutes. Uh, the resulting architecture is not flat and hard, but fuzzy, fluffy, furry, shaggy. It is simultaneously primitive and high tech. It is not permanent, but temporal. It is an architecture that requires caretaking and maintenance like a landscape or an occupant. The exterior of the installation is flat and angular, reflecting more conventional architectural production, while the interior is undulating, suggesting possibilities for further customization and the creation of integrated sculpted furniture. 
Homegrown is seen alternately as a rune or as a topiary hedge. Viewed as a whole, the work begs a questioning of how our buildings are made, the materials with which they are constructed, and the new potentials that might be unveiled as these established systems and societal expectations might be reimagined. For us, the value of the fellowship lies in the construction of a conceptual trajectory, extending, we hope, beyond the singular project and offering an experimental and raw line of inquiry, which can evolve and develop uh, over the coming years. Thank you. Great, thank you both. Uh, those were four really uh, incredible presentations, Alvin. Um, I have a question that I could kick us off with, uh, unless you do. But I also just wanted to give a call to everyone that we have a few questions that have come in through the chats that we're holding on to. Um, we're on time, so thank you everyone for doing a great job presenting. Uh, if you have other questions, please add them to the chat. And uh, Katie and Kyle, is it okay if we call on people to ask the questions? Is that, can they unmute? Yeah, of okay. course. Everybody should have the ability to unmute and also to, to turn on their videos if they'd like to be visually a part of the discussion. Oh, that'd be great. Okay. Alvin, do you have a do you have a question to kickstart? Uh, no, you can go ahead. Okay, so uh, I do. I have a question for Zach that could be opened up for others. But you know, there's one thing in watching these four presentations that is really striking me. And I think it speaks to the kind of best intentions of what fellowship should be, um, is that a fellowship is, I think, uh, something that an institution is investing as an incubator to, to kind of cultivate new ideas for the future of our discipline. Um, and what I was seeing in each of these presentations was versions of trailblazing, like finding new paths, different ways of thinking about architecture, different ways of uh, exploring some of these ideas and um, one of them, which is which is coming up uh, in my mind here, uh, as with a few other notes, Zach, um, your introduction of the topic of leaky time, I think that's the term you used, leaky time? Well, it's leaky machines, but leaky time is Le good too, yeah. Okay, so I'll adapt it to be leaky time because um, the other parallel that I wanted to draw here, I'll, I'll maybe, this might be a faux pas or, or too much of a uh, projection, but fellowships uh, seem also to be a uniquely American thing within uh, the discipline of architecture. And uh, the European model is more in following PhD uh, pursuits. And I can't help but notice a, a difference in the discussion and discourse amongst different conferences. If you go to Europe for, for certain uh, uh, conferences or here in America, the approaches can either be incrementally uh, addressing something that's previously established uh, through the PhD model or really trailblazing, breaking new boundaries, thinking of things differently. Uh, particularly in the fabrication community. I mean, it's largely dominated by aspirations of efficiency. And there's a lot of work, especially in like conferences like uh, Robots and Architecture that are, are talking about like real time feedback, and, which is a fallacy, you know, nothing is real time, it's a, close to real time. And to see you talk about this in a, in a totally different point of view, which is like, actually we shouldn't try and make this real time. Like let's use that leaky time as a productive measure. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you got to that point of thinking about uh, breaking away from ideas of efficiency because it, it, it also deals with uh, other topics that you weren't necessarily addressing directly like aesthetics, uh, but are clearly present in your work. Yeah, it's a good question. Um... And, you know, I mean, I've been at those and presented at those conferences and contended with similar questions when, you know, uh, at Robark, for example, um, when I presented some of the dripping work, people uh, responded by saying, well, you know, that was different, um, you know, and, and, I, and I was the only person on the panel to get any question about aesthetics. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I would say, yeah, and it's, a, it's really interesting to bring up real time because that's something that I've also like, thought about and written about um, 
and it is a complete fallacy, right? Like everything has delay in it, actually. Delay is like the other face, the other side of real time, right? Like we actually need delays in all like real time computation actually has like, you know, imperceptible delays, but they're there, right? And so it's a matter uh, to me of, of framing ultimately and, and what framing helps you do the work that you wanna do, right? Or the work that you feel is most important. So. You know, um, I'm not going to say that delay is better than real time or in making it like into a kind of value judgment, but I think what I'm trying to get at is the potential to develop our own theoretical models of how machines work and not just, you know, inherit understandings from adjacent disciplines that they have to work in a certain way, right? Like, because all the robots we use, we've inherited from industrial manufacturing, basically, right? And, and the, the kind of baggage that comes with that is that they must be fast, they must be efficient, they must be precise. Um, but we, we, don't, we don't need that in architecture necessarily, right? And we, we don't need to also, and we should be mindful that we're inheriting these concepts um, along with the kind of technology uh, and that we're capable of thinking differently, right? And we have our own concepts in our discipline that we can uh, like like temporality and materiality, which are more important to architects, I would say, than like industrial manufacturers, um, that we can use to kind of rethink uh, and, and and sort of make what I call theoretical models of, of of these technologies, in order to design and work with them in a kind of different manner. So, I don't know if that answers your question. But. Yeah, that's great. I'll just give a, a few seconds if anyone has a follow up or Alvin. Yeah, I guess my question is more, uh, I'd like to ask something like for all four, and I think that is kind of, let's say, you know, all four projects are, are extremely unique and, and quite different from one another. And so I think, you know, let's say, our, discussing their, their connections is, is a little bit difficult, but actually the framework is, is probably where they have more connection, obviously, through the fellowship and uh, through the kind of, let's say, there is a, a sort of unifying theme of, of uh, I guess somebody in the chat earlier mentioned the term transgressive and I wouldn't say it's exactly transgressive, but it is, is definitely uh, all four projects are looking to uh, challenge conventions or, or, or look outside of the norm. But I think one of the things that uh, always strikes me about architecture is, is that I like to think of architecture as this kind of uh, materialization of value systems. Um, and if 2020 has given us anything, it's the understanding that uh, value systems are contextual um, and identifying that uh, the context of our values are, are something that uh, drives them and, and reprioritizes them and shifts them. And so like uh, all, all forms of creation, architecture is a contextual act, not just about physical context, but also uh, let's call it historical context or political context or social context. Um, and I'm very curious how the context of the fellowship and the sort of structure of the fellowship combined with the context of uh, 2020, or let's say, has impacted the work. And if it's, let's say, changed the way you might approach the work, or even the way you talk about the work now, post fact. I, mean, I think that's a really interesting question. And um, I mean, for us, our fellowship was, uh, I would say like in some ways kind of cut short by the pandemic, right? It hit mid spring semester. So we had started like one of those courses uh, that was sort of critical to exploring some of these ideas in the work. Um, but it also presented some, I mean, I guess we had to view them as opportunities, right? With the switch to digital learning. Um, and one of the things that we're interested in, and this also might relate back to Brandon's question about um, aspirations of efficiency, or we're pretty critical of the term uh, like optimization in architecture and in processes. Um, but we have been looking at kind of different methods of machine visioning and 3D scanning, and are a little bit critical of, uh, I don't know, the reliance of some um, so kind of digital fabrication processes on like as much data and as much precision as is possible. Um, and I think when we see like kind of the effects of like what I would say is material imposition in a really interesting way in Zach's work, which I really admire. Um, 
But we had worked with students in that seminar to sort of generate new methods of digitizing objects and then creating like architectural assemblies using those things that they were all doing at home just with their phones and on their, their laptops uh, without a ton of computing power. And so I guess in some ways those kind of limitations due to that switch to digital uh, just became another sort of force that made more urgent some of the um, concerns that we had been looking at earlier. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, Adam, I don't know. Sorry, I don't want to cut you off. Oh. Um, okay, I'll just I'll just jump in. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. Um, you know, in terms of like thinking about this idea of the materialization of value systems. Um, just to address the first thing Alvin said. Um, yeah, I think that this year was a wake up call for a lot of us in terms of, you know, addressing the material, the, the cultural aspect of, of the material interest that a lot of us have, I think. Um, and also the fact that we are, all of us seem to be interested in alternatives to, to, to norms, I think is perhaps um, uh, a bit, uh, um, you know, curious considering, I think, due to uh, the need for norms <laughs> that I think a lot of us have, have noticed in terms of the politics of our, of our country right now. Um, uh, in, in order for, like, uh, us to be a, a community and to, to have any kind of discourse, we need to have norms. We need to have some kind of norms so that we can talk to one another. Um, so in terms of like us all being interested in the transgressive, I'd also be interested in what kind of norms we're interested in maintaining, um, which, what is the sort of irreducible, what are the sort of irreducible norms of, of architecture that we, we need to, con to carry forward? And like, what is the value of norms? What is the value of breaking from those norms? I think is interesting. Um, and then to add, answer the question about I guess the material conditions of the, the fellowship, yeah, the, the pandemic really threw everything off. That studio work I showed, we were in the middle. Um, a lot of it was meant to, it was designed to be hands-on working with materials and found objects. And then like recapitulating those through uh, different materials um, that also had their own aesthetic um, meanings and associations and feelings. Um, so this idea of like a disembodiment in terms of our relationship to material, I think is challenging um, because the way that we react emotionally um, to, to, to materials as images is, is quite different from, uh, all, you know, cutting off all the other senses that we have. And unfortunately, um, it, it privileges really a, a visual experience of architecture, which I think um, leaves out a lot of people who, uh, you know, uh, can't necessarily see things or, you know, have uh, better ways of learning, different ways of learning who are not visual thinkers or visual learners. So I think that's um, been a challenge. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's, it's a really good question also. And being somebody who's been looking at co-anything, um, it, like threw off everything um, because people need to be together in order to, you know, co-live and co-work. And I think what it taught me or what it, what it illuminated and what I frankly wish I, the, I what I, I don't know, what I wish I maybe did during the fellowship um, and what's kind of impossible to do in a silo when thinking about, you know, issues of co-living and co-working is operating in a silo. Like you need the kind of gritty ugliness of people smelling nearby and somebody playing their music too loud and this and that, um, which I miss now. I would love that. That would be great um, to have to deal with, you know, somebody's whatever, but um I think, yeah, again, it's just sort of illuminated the necessity of the work I'm doing to like incorporate people, um, which is really hard to do generally uh, specula speculatively because you have to make a lot of assumptions about 
the way people ought to behave and you get into sort of scripting people's, um, you know, like scripting narratives, which is uh, insufficient, I guess. Um, or sort of presupposing a kind of, I mean, it's the same thing, presupposing a kind of subject. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of a uh, thing that I'm reckoning with now. And I think the, the, the pandemic has, has illuminated that. Yeah, I mean, I, if I could just add a, a bit, um... I mean, obviously, just like like the other presenters, uh, my you know, I haven't made a pile since last February, um, and uh, I was teaching a studio that was based on uh, concrete three D printing, or you know, revolved around concrete three D printing in a lab that I set up at OSU, and you know, students couldn't be in that lab after March. So, yeah, I mean, it, it really shook things um, in terms of my own experience. Um, but then, you know, in terms of this kind of this question of materialization of value systems and, and sort of like obviously and, and what I tried to and hopefully communicated in my presentation is like, you know, I, for me, this what happened with the executive order and what ha was happening in, in the world was like unavoidable because I was so I was already doing something which like completely, completely by accident. I was already doing something which immediately became kind of relevant and topical in a way that I had unintended. And then I was sort of um, uh, really I had to wrestle with with yeah what 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 my work means in a very different sense. Um, uh, and and I guess you know and it's something I'm still doing. Hence the kind of presentation of trajectory and not product, um, because I'm still sort of searching for for the uh, the values that are are latent in in the things I'm producing. Um, but I also don't know. I'm also not confident that they exist. Um, you know, I think like, or that they need to exist. Like, I think that this, uh, that Adam's, you know, um, Adam's comment about like needing norms is really fascinating. And, and I would say, you know, I, I don't know if I agree with that necessarily. I mean, because similarly, it suggests like we need like a baseline value system against which to like evaluate all other values, right? And I don't know if that exists. I think it's like really like an evolving thing. Uh, you know, norms are evolving things. There's not like, you know, not like, like the classical, there's no kind of like timeless value system. There's no kind of timeless order against which we can sort of adjudicate or evaluate uh, all other architectural value systems or, or political value systems, right? Um, yeah, and I, so I, I don't really have an answer, but I just like, I think it's, it is a really a moment of reckoning um, for, for me where I find myself kind of, you know, I don't have an answer yet, but I find myself um, thinking that the answer is like in the process itself, right? That like that, that, that part, this part of this, uh, you know, coming back to the idea of efficiency, I would say like, it's not about products and efficiencies or orders or values, it's about you know, products are, or, or rather processes and traces um, and, and sort of readings, you know, it's about like eliciting participations and readings and not about suggesting symbols and meanings. It's really interesting, um, Zach, I think what you're saying and uh, in particular, the, the executive order and the classical column, because I think you kind of explicitly call out the the classical column as a power structure. Um, but as a group, we've all kind of called out a power structure, right? Um, Jacob is like subversively intervening and co-working, which is something you ubiquitous and seen as desirable, right? It's kind of transformed the workplace, right? Adam's taking the Vitruvian man, which is how we see, uh, how we see ourselves, right? As humans, right? How we see an ideal, right? And, a, and a kind of attacking the body. Um, and I think we're taking on like the two by four. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting to me as a collection to see like what these power structures might be uh, as kind of material objects, but also that hold cultural value. But I think it yeah, also I mean, gets to... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Alvin. Oh, I was gonna say just that it also, I think goes back to something else Jacob said, or Zach said earlier actually, which he talked about uh, um, opportunity and privilege 
you know, and the fact that uh, his opportunity came about because of particular privileges he had as one, a citizen, two, as somebody who socioeconomically could afford the, the move and all, all of these issues. And I think it does strike me, and, you know, I'm guilty of this myself, but I think all of us are, and I think all of architecture is, and our, our power systems of, of academia in the sense of I'm looking across this panel and going through all the bios, it's like, you know, we have an entire panel full of uh, Ivy League educated or equivalent, edu you know, Berkeley, not Ivy, but it's still Berkeley, right? But it's, you know, it, it, it's, you know, and the voices that uh, dominate these fellowships, um, like, I think it is not something I haven't noticed as somebody who teaches at a, a non Ivy and has just started a fellowship at our school that all of the fellowships tend to be at non-Ivy schools, but tend to only appoint Ivy graduates, right? And so there is this sort of aspirational kind of context of, of these fellowships of bringing Ivy voices into other institutions. Um, that is also a sort of, for lack of a better term, a, a kind of reinforcement of privilege and a reinforcement of the kind of opportunities that are being given through privilege. Yeah, I mean, I think like I, I struggle with that as well, Alvin. I wanna try and lead this into a question for a discussion also, but like, I think there is the possibility. I mean, we're seeing an explosion of fellowships, right? You know, 15 years ago, there were a handful of them I believe they started at Michigan. Um, then we get Ohio State and Rice, and the, the, now they're starting to expand. Right now at MIT, we have six fellows. Um, and uh, MIT is also technically not an Ivy school, but you know, I think your point is well taken. I think uh, one thing that I'm wary of is that uh, schools use fellowships as a recruitment tool. And the intention, you know, the, I think there's nothing wrong with that as long as what we're looking for is the recruitment of diversity and diversity of opinions as well. Uh, because naturally, the, the, the point of a fellowship is you're bringing someone in from the outside uh, and that that person coming in from the outside is being situated in an alien environment themselves. So it makes sense to me that we're seeing presentations that are testing the boundaries, pushing the limits, blazing new trails and maybe resisting um, things that are canonical. Like it, it would be strange to uh, see a, a fellowship presentation that talked about reinforcing the canon. I'm convinced that uh, that's a false question anyway. So one of the experiences I had uh, in, I won't name the fellowship, uh, but I had, I had a great experience in the fellowship, but you know, there's this idea that you come in, you say, we want you to bring fresh uh, points of view. Uh, we're gonna give you some space to do that. And then after they find out what your fresh point of view is, they say, well, we want it different, but you know, that's not what we had in mind. So I guess I would kind of want to ask the juicy question of like, where is that friction that you've come up against if you don't mind disclosing um, all the, I should note this is a recorded session. Um, like a, as these two worlds are coming together, these two desires that could work symbiotically uh, where has that kind of rubbed up against and maybe shaped the way that you think about your research? That's for any one of the four. Are you asking if the people who hired us regretted it? Yeah, basically. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I think part of the privilege of the fellowship, something I was told um, was that you have you meaning me have the and the other two fellows have the luxury of not having a jury final review essentially anyone to answer to you um which is kind of fucked up uh uh little yeah and so no i mean i think the the, the friction on my end anyway it was sort of like we're trust you're you're being entrusted with this very very privileged position um you know whether people liked what i did or not who who knows but ultimately it didn't i don't know maybe it matters in some way but I, it wasn't immediate it wasn't communicated to me in any sort of way and i think for me anyway the reason i've moved toward a kind of like 
um, seemingly, well, I'm like, I'm like dangerously rubbing up against a capitalist uh, uh, position is, is because I am in part rejecting the idea of, you know, like certainly for myself anyway, invention and, and originality and moving instead toward, you know, like more conventional models of reproduction of, of, of things. Um, so like the industrial designer thing, sort of taking away the, the one-off idea um, as a political position, I would say. Um, so, but yeah, I don't know. I think I'd be very curious, yeah, to hear if people experience this because anyway, on my end, it was very much, uh, you had the luxury of sort of doing what you wanted to do. Or sorry, I yeah, there was a lot of autonomy whatever. and protection of that uh, space from yes. your point of view. That's great, definitely. I I, I'm, I have the same experience. There's a lot of autonomy. Um, sometimes I actually wish there was a little bit um, more of a, a little bit of oversight. Um, just as someone who like is kind of really just getting started. It's it's kind of scary, you know, just figuring it out as you go in a way. I, I know all of us, I'm sure have experienced that. Um, so in some ways, I wish it was a little, a little, a little bit less autonomous, but I'm glad that they let me uh, make courses about whatever I wanted. I'm really glad about that because I think that I would have found friction at different institutions. Um, and in part, I think the reason I'm, I was allowed to just uh, write the coursework however I like is I think because they, this, this fellowship that I'm doing is, is meant to explicitly address like more political aspects of architecture. So in terms of like, um, asking more difficult, more friction type questions. Like I was kind of given that uh, okay and sort of go ahead with my title to kind of ask those kinds of friction questions. And um, we put together a very frank gender symposium talking about equity and architecture, um, which asked, you know, kind of criticized um, institutions and things. And that's kind of scary to do when you are uh, at the, um, when you're basically a guest of an institution. That's so, a really good point, yeah. Yeah, and I'm still a guest of the institution right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm gonna answer without getting myself into trouble, hopefully, or, or try to answer if I get myself into trouble. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I guess I was in, in the beginning of my fellowship, I was in a weird position or felt like I was in a weird position um, partially because of, uh, you know, how it was orchestrated. Um, it was very sort of last minute and there's a lot to sort of get adjusted to in a short period. But, um, uh, you know, I, as I said, I was kind of brought in to be a, a digital fabrication person, um, but really like I don't see myself that way. Um, you know, I, I, like I was brought in to sort of quote unquote tool up a school that like did not have tools. Um, and, and like, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm like a robot person, you know, like I, I'm, I'm actually pretty anti-robot or at least robotic arm. Um, and so there was, you know, I was a bit nervous. I, I think like what they would think of my kind of version of, of digital fabrication um, and, and hence, you know, the kind of the, the, that performance I did really like the third day that I was there where I sat out in the middle of school and I'm like, you know, I was like, this is, this is who I am. You know I mean? This is who I am. <laughs> this is what I like to do. And it like, and it was really great because there's just a bunch of students like coming up and be like, whoa, a 3d printer. And I was like, whoa, okay. So like, that's the bar that I have to like, this is what I'm, this is what I'm, I'm the 3d printer ambassador. Um, and, and it was great. You know I mean? Like if for, I think for the school and for me, then, you know, after that point, I felt that I was had some autonomy, and I, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I could kind of do as I please. But it, but I think yeah, I, I, it, it was interesting kind of operating this fellowship that was designed to like do a very specific thing for the school. I think, um, 
and, and feeling a kind of uh, obligation to do that in part without at the same time kind of pursuing my own interests within that field. Um, so. Yeah, I think this is a really uh, valuable conversation. It reminds me of last week, Michael Jefferson sort of described the uh, relationship between like the content or maybe radicality of a um, fellowship project has as a like Venn diagram with like the interests of an institution. And there has to be a kind of overlap between like the fellowship proposal and the like interest from the school. Like it has to be radical, but not too radical in some ways. And I thought that's a really interesting way to think about it as this maybe sort of matchmaking process where the fellowship is something often that you're um, sort of uh, being placed in that position based on a certain project proposal or a certain agenda, which of course is maybe part of the hiring process for other positions in academia, but maybe not so explicitly like a singular proposal. Um, and for us, I don't think that we've yet had like the evaluation maybe from the school because our um, fellowship lecture at uh, the University of Tennessee hasn't happened yet. Uh, I think we're hopefully waiting until we can do that in person. Um, but the faculty were, I think, receptive to a lot of the things we were doing. And it was interesting, maybe the most pushback we got was actually from some of the students in our studio um, that we taught. I don't think about our, our sort of um, motivations as being particularly radical, um, but we've been in it for a little while. So maybe they are more than I think of them. But um, we, of course, had some students who like engaged with it immediately and some who were um, sort of more resistant, sort of questioning why we were doing things the way we were, which I think is also part of the process and super valuable. Um, and it wasn't until uh, later in the semester, we spent a long time like working with those students to document their projects, like the photos of the built installations you saw earlier. And um, some of those photos and content was picked up by a couple of um, kind of press outlets last spring. Um, and it took that kind of like outside interest or validation for those students to maybe kind of like uh, I don't know, like place value in, in that particular, uh, I don't know, method of working or whatnot. Um, so I think that was interesting how, I don't know, the, the, where the validation comes from, uh, I think is an interesting part of this. Yeah, I would agree. The students are the toughest critics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I think, well, maybe, we'll, go ahead, Eddie. No, I was just gonna say, but maybe that like you can make the biggest impact there, right? Like when your ideas are um, coming from outside the school, they're either gonna get the most friction from the students or like the biggest embrace, right? Um, if, if that's what the student was looking for, so. Yeah, if, sorry, I, if we could still, if I could add one more thing here, if we could stick to this topic. Um, since you were t both talking about students, um, course there's the the demands from students all across you know the United States and abroad like making demands to to their schools and institutions to change things very quickly and so you know since my title kind of is to to deal with some of those issues I felt as an impotence in terms of being able to address some of those demands just in in part due to like the fact that I'm leaving and that I'm sitting on a committee on diversity and equity, which is a, um, you know, which is a service thing, uh, right? And I'm a lecturer, so there's always this idea of like, should I be doing this? But also, I feel like I want to do this, but it's it's uh, you know it's difficult. Um, and also, these committees don't really have a lot of power to they don't. They don't control funding sources. So how, how can we more effectively address student demands or how do we reconcile with them, I think, is has been a, a, a friction. Um, it, in terms of like, I would like to not have a friction with it. Um, the friction being in my sort of impotence in terms of like what I can do in my, in my position. Um, the limits of what I can do to address those concerns. Hmm. Yeah, that's just, it's interesting to hear that. Is that maybe we can transition in, into some uh, questions from the audience also, but Adam, you're raising a point that, that, that I think we could talk about a little bit as well as things progress is that sometimes fellowships are really intended to be autonomous in the case, uh, as Jacob outlined, 
And other times they're really meant to be a kind of like incubator to come into the school and reshape the school. Um, and those two different approaches are, are in opposition to each other. It seems to me that schools take one line or the other. I haven't really found an in-between space with that. Um, but maybe if, if we can transition over, I think Devin, you had a question and you said that you wouldn't mind sharing that live. Sure. Um, well, Great. thanks, Brandon. And uh, thanks to all the presenters um, who I, I haven't seen Jacob for a while. Good to see you, Jacob. And uh, Katie and Kyle, of course, I've seen a lot of you uh, recently. So um, I guess, you know, my question in the chat was, and it had kind of been discussed a little bit as the conversation got going, but none of you had had kind of, I don't think, directly addressed aesthetics. I mean, I think you use other framings or terminologies. But you know, I was kind of interested in this question of the, uh, of the aesthetic of your work in each of the cases, because in a way that's, that's sort of the first way that most people kind of engage, you know, that, that your audience is kind of engaged with the work. Um, and so, you know, for instance, you know, and Katie and Kyle, I, I know I'm interested in your kind of, you know, what I've heard you speak about in terms of the idea of, of your work somehow um, creating a, a framework to kind of challenge certain perceptions or narratives of, of certain materials and, and the, the kind of associations that you might have with it, an invasive, you know, a deemed invasive plant or something, or more um, directly kind of in, in Zach's uh, presentation, the idea of, of engaging, you know, or challenging the notions of, of style, um, or, you know, for instance, in Adam's presentation about notions of, of uh, taste and, and culture and all these sorts of things. So it kind of touches on all that. I guess what I would ask, having we kind of like talked a little bit around some of these framings a little bit, I guess what I'm kind of curious about now, and, um, you know, Katie and Kyle, I'm glad you mentioned your students as being somewhat skeptical maybe of some of the approach. I guess one of the things that kind of ties into that maybe is how have you found that the aesthetic positioning of your work, um, you know, what has it revealed about the audiences um, that are kind of consuming what you're putting out, whether in terms of teaching or, or you know, publications or whatever. And has it, has it any of that reception made you rethink aspects of the work in significant ways? Yeah, thanks for your question, Devin. I think, um, I mean, maybe to start off, I, I, I don't usually use uh, like the term aesthetics when I'm describing the work. I, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm gonna have to think about why that is, but I think about it more in terms of like cultural perception or like what the kind of larger reception is. Um, because maybe like relative to some of Adam's ideas about taste, I think all of these things are sort of like filtered through a set of um, maybe societal values, right? And we're sort of seeing all kinds of new work or especially things that are maybe more novel or more experimental or less conventional um, with the kind of like baggage of expectation of what sort of, um, I don't know, we as designers or even more in the case of the general public, like what they kind of expect architecture to be or the materials they expect architecture to be made with. Um, and so, I don't know, our desire in um, the fellowship in tackling invasive species as a kind of material stream came from some of these sort of like ecological ideas and a sort of agents or, um, I don't know, desire to address that sort of urgency uh, of the kind of climate crisis. Um, but it was also sort of trying to choose some material that would be maybe farther away on the spectrum from like the conventional sort of expected material. Um, and so like kudzu is the poster child for invasive species in the South and everybody, uh, you know, in Tennessee and Virginia has a story about kudzu and, and uh, an encounter with it. Um, and so I think it's interesting to see that, um, I don't know, sometimes people, especially outside the discipline, when we kind of explain that we're sort of trying to use those materials productively, um, there's kind of an interest in it maybe because it's, I don't know, perceived as more novel maybe, or because they, uh, I don't know, it's just farther from what would be expected. But our desire basically was to um, tackle that, again, being farther off on the um, spectrum of like expected to unconventional. 
Um, and I think building, physically building the thing and having photographs of the built thing is really valuable um, in like placing, working within this sort of dialogue in that it's like a kind of proof of concept, right? And obviously we have a long way to go before we employ that system like at a building scale or especially like think about codifying it and bringing it into a set of standards that are needed for like the production of like architecture with a capital A or what the, the public would expect from architecture. Um, but it's kind of a first step. And so the production of it and the aesthetics of it are, are we're trying to use to question those ideas and um, hopefully maybe shift the needle a little bit on uh, what people expect from some of these materials and processes. Um, in relation to Devin's and Brandon's earlier question, um, I I think that the relate the, the so the way that the Michigan Fellowship works is you teach two classes in the fall and one in the spring. And the spring one in my case was a called a proposition studio, which is like you propose something and then students ballot and you teach the thing to 10 students or so, 12 students. Um, and I treated the fellow, I treated that largely as a sort of extension for better or worse. I'm not sure if this is a good idea, but as an extension of the research, I guess that's to be expected. Um, but in terms of like what I came away with from students, uh, uh, student evaluations are really useful. Um, and they were good, like they were positive, but also they were like, this guy, he's like pretty young. Like he's, you know, like that. that's like a thing. And I was like, I am actually pretty young. And it would be really nice. I think like, I don't know if anyone is on a fellowship committee that's here, um, some, you know, like way of thinking about mentorship uh, and not assuming, at least I'll speak for myself. It would have been nice to have some sort of shepherding as a fellow, because while you know, uh, I, I feel you know competent. I, I'm not like wandering around in the dark. Um, I think the student, the interaction with the students taught me that you know, like my senior colleagues are. It it gave it gave me a lot of respect for my senior colleagues and 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 the and their expertise in teaching. And I think that's something that you're really, or I was really thrown into um, and had to kind of figure out on the fly. And we haven't really talked about that. Um, I know there's not enough time, but the responsibility one has to, you know, like students' education that they're paying a lot for. Um, and so I think that that could be a valuable on both ends, you know, like both for the fellow, for me and for students. Um, and that's something I could, I only learned after, after the fact. Um, so thanks to the students who are writing those things. All right, so we have uh, another question here from, oh, sorry. I, sorry. I was muted and forgot. Um, I mean, if I can just turn to, to Devin's question and, um, Maybe also kind of offer a question to Adam in a sense because I was just really I was really excited by by your presentation, Adam, and never having seen your work before. I think there's a lot of affinities, maybe um, or similarities between our, our thoughts. Um, but so I mean, towards the question of aesthetics, um, I would say you know, um, and and what I'm trying to the sort of value, you know, coming back to this idea of like value generating aesthetics. Uh, audiences that you're trying to reach um, with your aesthetics. I mean, I, I I certainly don't, I try not to shy away from the, the word aesthetics. I didn't mean to like replace style for aesthetics. I don't think that they're the same um, at all. Um, and, and and gladly talk about aesthetics. I mean, pe people see my work and tend to like talk about aesthetics even before I do. Um, and, 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 uh, you know, but I, I, yeah, I definitely don't try to avoid the question. Um, I, I think in terms of the aesthetics that I aim for or that I think about and why I, I, 
uh, I think, you know, I'm curious what, uh, what Adam thinks about this, um, is, is a kind of aesthetics of the body. Um, so, uh, you know, I, that's why, again, like I use words like leaky, you know, in describing my work, uh, because I want us, I, I want us architects to see our work as, as, as material thing, as something that leaks, right? Just like we leak, people leak, you know, we all, we leak on a daily basis. Uh, we're leaking right now, air. Um, and, and I think I, that's, you know, so I, 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 I like to see, see my work as always leaking in a sense, or always dripping um, as kind of, you know, uh, bodies, you know, I mean, that's a bit of a cliche, you know, architecturally say bodies in motion or something like this, but, but you know, like a body, like a, like a, like a weird, saggy, flabby, you know, drippy body. Um, and, and I, like, I really mean that from like, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that I like, I don't mean that as like a provo provocateur. Like, I, I mean that because I think it's really important to, to be, to, to renew our sense of architecture as a kind of embodiment. Um, I, I, I mean that from a kind of, you know, um, in part from a sort of this idea about like identity politics, um, and our own identities, our architectural identities, uh, I think it's important to, to kind of renew that perception in a sense. Can I, can I follow up on that though? Because what, what I find so interesting about, I, I mean, I think, I, I think it's present a little bit in all, the, all of the projects a little bit, but you take on one of the most kind of sacred shibboleths of architecture, which is like the classical order in a way. And I'm just wondering if you ever got any kind of like, because what's interesting about there's like a there's almost like a kind of affinity to avant-garde art practices in which, you know, like the digital craft of actually what you're trying to do requires a very high level of knowledge to make something that most people would say, well, why would you ever make that? You know, I'm sure that there is some degree to at somewhere somehow you must have encountered somebody that has this almost kind of passive aggressive attitude towards like, why would you do that? Or, you know, in the case of Katie and Kyle, like, why would you ever build a, a, something out of kudzu? You know what I mean? So I guess for me, I think it's, 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 that's where I think that there, there's this, in all the projects, there's this, I think it requires a lot of bravery and, and, and talent to kind of try and take on some of these topics and kind of craft a position around what they can communicate um, beyond just simply providing something of immediate, you know, kind of architectural spatial value, but it's about a kind of world of ideas that need to be deliberated in, in public in a way. Devin, I think it's an interesting question. And I think maybe um, something that, that bubbles to the surface for me is that uh, you're, you know, you're kind of describing how in, in particularly maybe the American context, um, deviations from the aesthetic norm uh, are, are resisted, right? Um, and, uh, you know, mostly outside of the discipline, but it, within the discipline as well. Um, and so there's a kind of uh, result that, that happens on, on what does get built as permanent architecture in terms of its aesthetic question, right? And, and so I might like, pair this as like uh, two sides of a coin or a kind of contrast. So in the States, it might be more difficult to build um, uh, a, a, di a different looking uh, permanent project, but it's easier to take risks through the fellowship system um, than perhaps in the European system where it might be more difficult to take risks in a PhD program, um, but it's easier to take aesthetic risks in the production of you know, built, permanent public projects. So I, I, I don't know exactly why, why those are, but I think that the, uh, the you know, Brandon's framing of, of the fellowship as being a kind of uh, different thing than, than the European model is pretty interesting. And I wonder how it gets tied up in questions of aesthetics as well. So we have uh, another question here uh, with from Amelyn. Oh, hey, sorry. This is a, such a good conversation, so I didn't want to like disrupt it or anything. But um, I might adjust my question uh, on gender and the machine a little bit for everybody. I wanted to ask about like 
the presupposed subject, I guess, the role, or maybe the role of agency, and maybe if you could um, try to um, define in the work that you, you all do, like that, what, what has changed in like political agency versus technical agency, and those things are different, but at the same time, like what are the productive overlaps, and where do you see that, like kind of spaces of, of appearance still happening in, in something that's kind of, um, you know, um, you know, increasingly having a kind of uh, human machine feedback. So I don't know, it's just more an open question about, about agency and um, disposition. But I love the saggy dripping body and yeah, you kind of alluding to the questions there. I think that was mainly directed at Adam and Zach, maybe as a starting point. At Adam, do you want to take away? Sure. Yeah. So I'm just looking at the question you wrote here. Um, are machines gendered? What does semi-automated subjectivity look like? How to think through gender equity and fabrication technology together? Um, so are machines gendered? Um, I think they are. <laughs> Alexa is a, a woman, um, potentially, or at least feminized. I think, if not, if not explicitly gendered, it, um, I think that they are playing into tropes of gender um, and expectations we have about service and the gender of service, the gender of, of domestic labor, or the demand. The yes. The, the gender of secretaries, for example, the gender of um, subservience to human need, which historically has been uh, a feminine, a feminized kind of uh, gender. So um, historically, uh, women are were doing the roles of these things that Alexa is now doing for us. Um, and or being done by slaves or domestic servants. So it's also, you know, potentially racialized. But um, in terms of thinking through gender equity and fabrication technologies, um, I think Shelby Doyle is, is someone who would be good to kind of have a touch point with uh, in terms of that. She, she talks a lot about sort of feminist ideas and in uh, fabrication technology. Um, so she'd be a good person to turn to for that. But I don't personally do a lot of digital fabrication. Um, I do a lot of uh, just like hand fabrication, but uh, maybe I can be helped out on that, that end of the, the, the question. I, I guess that, that's my cue. Um... Are machines gen? I mean, it's I'm not. I've honestly never thought about that question. But I, thinking about it now, I think machines must be gendered, or they must be seen that way because, you know, I taught a studio last semester, uh, on distributed manufacturing, and there was, you know, you were at the final review. I'm on actually. Uh, uh, there's 14 guys and one girl, you know, um, and so there must be this perception that like manufacturing is man. You know, it has man in it. Um, so, uh, and, and you know, and if I think about like the, the 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 physicality of the machines I work with, like you know, that deposit things, you know, and like robotic arms that like are these gigantic, you know, we could argue phallic like objects that just you know um, put just just drop things everywhere, right? Um, I also, you know, I mean, I'm going to really get myself in trouble, but you know, you like, there is this kind of like robot arms race where it's like, well, what robots do you have? You know, and it becomes this kind of like macho bravado thing. Um, so certainly, like, there's there's this kind of masculine culture associated with it. I think um, are the are the machines themselves gendered? I, I don't know. I'd have to think more about that. But I but I mean, I think like. Uh, Maybe the answer is in the second part of your question, which which I really I, I really like this idea of semi-automated subjectivity. I've never really, I think that's like an apt way to describe what I'm what I'm after personally. Actually, when I think about my my own work, like that the, that 
these machines, while they are, are capable of being automated, they're also capable of being interrupted. Um, and they're also capable of, of potentially dialoguing and also maybe more than anything else, being extensions um, of subjectivities and extensions of bodies, uh, not unlike, you know, uh, again, terrible overused metaphor, but like the hammer, right, um, as an extension of the arm, right? Um, and so is that an extension of your subjectivity? Like, like I would argue that contemporary machines, digital fabricated machines operate in a similar way or could operate in a similar way if we ch chose to choose to see them as such. But instead, we don't see like the kind of semi-automated potential. We just see like automation, everything as fast as possible when I want it right now, let's go, you know? Um, so I, I'm gonna keep, I'm, I'm gonna use that now. So we automated subjectivity. Does, does anyone else on the panel have, have a burning answer to Avalon's question? We're kind of running up against the clock here. I wanna make sure we have time for Katie and Kyle. Okay. Well, great. I mean, I thought this was a really productive conversation where we touched on quite a few subjects. Uh, and we did kind of mention materials every once in a while, but I think a, a, a richer understanding of fellowships, their intentions, how you engage them, and the kinds of questions that can emerge out of this focused uh, body of research that happens inside alien institutions. Um, so with that, I just, I don't want to say thank you, uh, for everyone for joining us, for having this productive conversation. Thank you for having me, uh, Alvin, thanks for joining. Thanks for being with us. And uh, maybe we can, we can cut our word. part. Yeah. So why don't we cut our part off now and pass it over to Katie and Kyle to introduce next week. Thanks, Brandon uh, and Alvin, so much for moderating and to all the fellows for presenting um, and to everyone for joining us. We just want to mention uh, that we hope everyone joins again uh, next week, um, next Tuesday at the same time, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Um, there'll be a, a session uh, themed publics um, with presentations by fellows Karen Kuby, Gergiana Mazoka, Young Tako, and Ryan Work. And the conversation will be moderated by uh, Sylvia Levin and Jason Young. So it should be super interesting. And we hope uh, that everybody can join us again. Yeah, uh, thanks to, to all the fellows for presenting tonight and, and Brennan and Alvin for moderating. And uh, uh, it was great to, to kind of engage with our work this week, but we look forward to going back to uh, the background next week. Um, and then, uh, yeah, finally, I think the, the topic next week will be maybe very important on the uh, evening before uh, Inauguration Day. Hope to see you then. Take care.